speakers today in the panel to talk about the contemporary issues in civil rights. Where are we today? How far have we come in the last 50 or so years? And Sarah Frohart Lane will give us an overview of the accomplishments and the unfinished agenda today for civil rights in our society. And the Parish Barnes will also speak about civil rights as it affects and is experienced on this campus. So, for brief introductions for the panelists. Gary Yerke uh, did um, postgraduate work at the American University of Beirut uh, after he finished a um, bachelor's degree in philosophy here. Um, and he was one of the three students who went with Reverend Thompson to Selma. He then became a uh, foreign correspondent and he worked in the Middle East and in Europe. Um, he reported as a foreign correspondent in many countries and he's published a book about the college students and the civil rights movement, which I mentioned south to Selma. He has other publications as well, which he will perhaps speak about in his presentation. David Schwartz also was a philosophy major at the same time. Interesting how philosophy led people to civil rights in those days, critical thinking. Um, David, uh, after he finished his bachelor's degree here in philosophy, he went to Scotland and for two years studied logic and metaphysics at the University of St. Andrews. He then returned to the United States and completed a PhD in philosophy from the, Uni philosophy from the University of California, Berkeley, and was on campus in the late 60s when that campus was alive for civil rights. He taught philosophy at Mount Holyoke College for many years and at other institutions of higher learning and has published a book and journal articles about the philosophy of language. He also had a 30-year career working for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, including managing regulatory development and promoting the use of electronic reporting by regulated industries to federal, state, and local environmental agencies. David will return to campus in the spring and he will talk about the current state of environmental protection and regulation for our natural resources. Le Parish Barnes is a graduate of the University of Illinois with a degree of history. He studied Nazi Germany, propaganda, and African American history. At Ripon, as a resident hall director, he strives to create a more diverse and positive environment for African American students. He's developed the BRO, or BRO, mentoring program for black male students on campus, which now includes 12 of Ripon's 18 black male students. Professor Sarah Frohart Lane holds a PhD in history from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. She was the Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Environmental History at Birmingham Southern College. She also has published two academic articles about racial tensions during World War II. So civil rights at Ripon, past and present, is the theme of our conversation, and that's what it will be, a conversation. We'll start with Gary Yerke, then David Schwartz, then Sarah, and then the parish. And after their presentations, they'll have a brief conversation among themselves about what they said, and then the parish will open it up to you uh, to ask questions, and he will repeat your question in the microphone so it can be picked up on the sound system. So thank you all for coming this afternoon, and thank you, panelists, for what you're going to do for us. Thank you, Brian, and thanks to the Center for Politics and People and the, the Center for Diversity and Inclusion uh, for inviting us. Brian is really quite incredible. Uh, so he like teaches a course in the great religions of the world or whatever he does, but then he also makes reservations for us at the Comfort Inn. <laughs> uh, he does everything. I was getting an email every two hours uh, about all sorts of things. But it, Why don't you be comfortable when you come back? <laughs> Uh, it's an honor uh, to be here sharing the program with Sarah and the parish, but especially with my uh, old buddy David. They had a, a theory, I think it was back then, that they would put a dumb kid with a smart kid. Uh, we were roommates together for a while. And my thinking has always been that they would put a dumb kid with a smart kid. And, you know, what could happen, you know. Theoretically, the smart kid could impart some of this wisdom onto a dumb kid, and, you know, but it didn't quite work out that way, so 
<laughs> David somehow got smarter. <laughs> it wasn't, anyway, it was a theory that I proved, uh, disproved, certainly. But anyway, I entered Griffin in 1960, and it was the beginning of a very turbulent uh, decade, of course. And while Ripon was not completely immune from what was happening uh, in, the, in the rest of the country, uh, it was isolated geographically and culturally, which is an, uh, an obvious point. Uh, obvious other schools were more deeply involved in issues of the day. Uh, the Vietnam War protests, the feminist movement, the rise of left-wing radicalism, and of course civil rights. <coughs> But I would argue that in many ways, uh, being in the heartland of the country, the concerns and attitudes of Ripon were more, did more accurately reflect the, the uh, feeling among uh, people in the country. Uh, as a whole, there was a lot of resistance to change, and there was a reluctance on uh, most people, I would argue, to get involved in uh, certainly what was going on in the Deep South at, at the time. <coughs> And what was going on in the Deep South, of course, was the perpetuation of the long entrenched uh, Jim Crow uh, laws and practices that were created and enforced by the white power structure to deny African Americans the rights afforded to other Americans. <laughs> and of course, there was a, a mass nonviolent civil disobedience um, protest movement against. Uh, that system and an attempt to, to overthrow it. By the mid-1960s, Martin Luther King, other leaders of the movement, had concluded that um, success of the movement would not uh, happen without the participation of, and more importantly, the pressure of a significant segment of the white population, particularly from, from the North. So in early March of 1965, uh, he called on religious leaders and others in the North to join him in Selma, Alabama, <coughs> which was the, is the county seat of Dallas County, and a hotbed of white resistance to racial equality at the time. <coughs> um, the immediate focal point was, and I'm sorry if a lot of you have already heard this story, and many of you were there, uh, or um, obviously, active during that period was a march that was being planned from Selma to the uh, capital of Alabama, Montgomery, some 54 miles away. <coughs> there the protesters were urged the governor of Alabama, <coughs> George Wallace, to guarantee the right to vote to all African Americans in the state. But Wallace, of course, was a staunch segregationist uh, who was unlikely to be moved by thousands of African Americans marching alongside a bunch of outside agitators, which is what we were called from the north. <coughs> but King and his associates believed that the spectacle of a march <coughs> involving whites and blacks would generate enough media publicity and coverage to, and public outrage to shame the federal government into taking action, even though the state uh, would not. <coughs> In his call to Northerners uh, like us to come to Selma, Martin Luther King said that the disease of racism was threatening to destroy America. And he said that no American is without responsibility. <coughs> um, the situation in Selma, which had been building for several weeks, came to a head on Sunday, March 7th, 1965, when Alabama State Troopers, armed with billy clubs and tear gas, beat back hundreds of African-American uh, protesters attempting to march to Montgomery. The incident, which became known as uh, Bloody Sunday, made for riveting news on national television that night <coughs> and on the front pages of newspapers across the country. But at Ripon, um, the news really sparked little interest among the student body. <coughs> um, we got word of it through various sources. Um, we have to remember that we had no social media, there were no cell phones. Uh, a little more difficult to get information back in those days. Um, but several of us, of us were interested in going to Selma 
even though that we were well aware of the risks involved um, in doing so. Blacks in the South, of course, were being beaten and killed by white races on a daily basis. Their homes and churches were being bombed um, and burned. And now as more and more whites uh, were becoming involved in the movement, uh, they were also coming under attack. Two white civil rights workers from the North, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, along with a black activist, James Cheney, were murdered by members of the Ku Klux Klan uh, near Philadelphia, Mississippi, in the summer of 1964. This was just before, obviously, uh, March of 1965. <laughs> and a white Unitarian minister from Massachusetts, James Reeb, was beaten to death by whites in Selma uh, just before, uh, just after Bloody Sunday in March of 1965. So there was a joke that was circulating among uh, would-be civil rights activists uh, from the north, like us, who were thinking of heading south. Um, it had one of the activists kneeling and praying to God, please, Lord, send me a sign that you'll go with me to Mississippi. And then after a long pause, there was a deep voice that came back and answered, um, OK, but I'll only go as far as Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go all the way to Mississippi. Go no far away. Um, at Ripon, uh, those of us who were intent on traveling to, to uh, Selma, I think there were about a dozen of us met with uh, Chaplain Thompson to seek his, his advice. Um, we knew that he would be supportive, as he later told the Ripon Commonwealth Press newspaper. Uh, this is a quote from, I'll call him Jerry. Uh, as long as there are places in the United States where these basic civil rights are denied, it is up to us Americans to do something about it. We can send money, but there are times when our physical presence is needed. <clears throat> End of quote. The problem was, of course, that we didn't have any money to send, let alone to finance a trip to, to Selma, uh, about a thousand miles away. So we proposed to pay for the trip with money from the student senate. And David was uh, a fellow philosophy major a friend, so I'm not sure who instigated the meeting. Um, but on Monday, March 15th, uh, in the evening, while violent clashes between protesters and the police were taking place um, near the Alabama State Capitol uh, in Montgomery, uh, David called a special meeting of the Student Senate to discuss our proposal. We figured we need about 400 dollars or so, which back then was a bit of money. <clears throat> At the meeting, Jerry came to our defense saying that the voting rights legislation that President Johnson uh, was about to send to Congress would not pass without continuing pressure from mem members of Congress uh, and uh, people like us, who, who's uh, members of Congress whose constituents were outraged by the events in some of the hit witnessed on national television. Uh, he's, uh, Chaplain Thompson said it was important for Ripon College to be represented in Selma as an institution. <laughs> Some members of the student senate argued that $400 could be spent better elsewhere, like writing a check to the NAACP or inviting a speaker to campus to lecture uh, students on the issue, which caused uh, Jim Bowditch, who I think he was an assistant professor of English or associate, I can remember, at the time in the English department. Um, but anyway, uh, Professor Bowditch blew up at this uh, idea. Uh, he said that throwing money at the problem would be the worst thing to do, that the physical presence of people from Selma, or people going to Selma uh, who care about the issues could make all the difference. So after about an hour of discussion, the Senate agreed by a vote of 13 to 9 to allocate $400 for our trip. Uh, Chaplain Thompson was made executor of the funds, and he asked us, those of us who were interested in going to Selma, 
to me to do this office at 11 p.m. Um, to make necessary arrangements. We agreed that we would leave for Madison and eventually Selma the next day. Uh, I volunteered in my 1964 Falcon for <laughs> transportation. Um, but that evening, the news that the Student Senate had allocated $400 to finance the college sponsored trip spread like, like wildfire through the campus. <coughs> um, students who had earlier been deaf to what was happening down south now found a reason to be outraged. <coughs> Leading the protest was Richard Singer. Um, is he here? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, sorry. He's a, a junior who uh, had a radio show on WRPN, and he urged students to uh, get WRPN and uh, <laughs> to urge students to demonstrate their opposition to this alleged misuse of student money at a mass rally on campus the next morning. <clears throat> and the next morning, I think it was probably around 400 students who he did Singer's Call and converged on Smith Hall, where David will talk about a meeting that what was being held that the President Pinkham had called uh, to, with Jerry and uh, David and uh, Dean Robert Ashley to discuss the issue. Um, never before had the school seen such a display of public indignation over the issue. Uh, the protesters who were protesting are right to go to protest uh, in another <laughs> uh, and act, They argued that the Senate had acted inappropriately without the full consent of the student body. But more importantly, they argued that what was happening somewhere and elsewhere in the South was none of our business. Um, there are a few students who uh, wrote about this and spoke, and a couple of them uh, said that they, um, it was ridiculous to go to Selma, and members of the Sigma, Sigma Chi fraternity, of which uh, Dave and I were members, um, voted 22 to 7 to protest the allocation of uh, the funds for our trip. And Fred Ruger, who was president of the Griffin chapter of the fraternity, <coughs> said that individuals going to Selma on their own dime was, was okay, but representing the school uh, with school funds was, was not okay. Um, just as an aside, I don't want to take too much time on this, but um, Dick Grimsrud, who was one of the three students who uh, eventually uh, turned up in Selma to, to, to march, and I went to the um, National headquarters of Sigma Chi, which at that time did not allow blacks hmm. in uh, in their in the fraternity, and we went to the national headquarters um, as part of our activism, whatever you want to call it, in Evanston, Illinois, to uh, protest that, and we got a very chilly uh, reception, but we felt that we were doing doing the right thing. So uh, David maybe could talk a little bit about that. It was an interesting the national representative finally came to Ripon and talked to us about uh, excluding blacks <laughs> and why they were doing that. Anyway, um, several students, however, publicly supported what we were attempting to do. And one I recall uh, very well was James Reed. He was a sophomore from Seattle who wrote in Ripon College Days, uh, and very eloquently, I think, for uh, the Times and um, as a sophomore at uh, school. He said, we Northerners don't have the right to go meddling in other people's affairs. Sounded reasonable on the surface. But he wrote that since African Americans in the South do not enjoy the same rights as others, it is not a local problem, but a national one. Quote, because we are a nation, are one nation and one people, unquote. Um, and he wrote, the denial of the right to vote to Mississippi Negroes can be a legitimate concern of someone living in Chicago. 
And if this individual is sensitive to the demands of the situation, he has every right, legal and otherwise, to meddle in Mississippi affairs. Perhaps the, he wrote that the, perhaps the basic reason that the problem has been going on for, has been so bad for so long is that sensitive people in the North have felt that what was going on in the South is none of their business. And then he said, what is going on in the South today is our problem as well as the South. And I think maybe to some of the younger um, people in the audience, this all sounds a little bit naive to be sort of discussing whether we have a responsibility um, to do things that are not really, you know, uh, any of our business. But at the time, there was something that was splitting the country uh, uh, very deeply. <coughs> the student, the school administration at uh, Ripon agreed that the student senate had acted with it, within its jurisdiction in allocating the funds for our trip. <coughs> um, and Jean Van Hengel, who was the dean of women at the time, um, said she was upset by the hasty and emotional demonstration that was held on the campus by students opposing the Senate decision. I'm not sure it accomplished anything. But she also did say that while um, the civil rights protests in the South had played an important role in arousing people's interest and concern and forcing attention upon the seriousness of the problem, she said, I'm not sure that uh, whether continuation of the Selma demonstrations is, is needed. Uh, but one of my heroes in this story was David <coughs> Harris, who was the dean of men at the time. <coughs> he was less circumspect, and he, he applauded the student's decision, a uh, student senate's decision, um, and thought that the student's demonstration against what we were uh, planning to do was completely misguided. He wrote, wouldn't you know that once they got off their apathy, it would be for the wrong reasons. <laughs> he, was, he said he was ashamed of the unseemliness of the uh, protests that were held on campus uh, the day we were about to leave for summer. Um, Dean Harris said, students traveling to Alabama were members of the Ripon family. <clears throat> we should have been there to shake their hands and see them off properly. This way, they left with memories of a screaming crowd, with few, few people knowing precisely uh, what they were concerned about. Um, he, he said that the student senate decision was courageous, and he said that the senate had finally concerned itself with, quote, something of vital significance to all Americans. He said there's a great oper educational opportunity uh, here. He said, we can go down to Selma and learn something. Do the stu students really want another jazz concert uh, funded by the Senate, or do they want a complete, well-rounded um, education? And, but Chaplain Thompson had his hands full trying to uh, control or calm the crowd that had uh, confronted him when they emerged uh, from the meeting with uh, President Pinkin and the others. Uh, in Smith Hall, um, he said that they, that a few of them actually laid down in front of my car to prevent us from uh, uh, taking off. And but um, Chaplain Thompson explained that the trip was necessary to show the school support for civil rights. Then, in a backhanded compliment to the protesters, he uh, praised them for showing interest in something. Uh, instead of beer and sex. <laughs> anyway, he, yeah. Okay. So he, but this, anyway, this, the crowd showed no signs, no signs of dispersion, so we uh, just drove off. Uh, and we got to Chicago, and we're told that it was too dangerous for us to... Um, to, uh, to go to Selma because there was so much violence going on there. So they sent us to Washington, D.C. instead to protest in front of the White House. Uh, we got there and spent <coughs> a day 
but then decided we really wanted to, to be in Selma. So um, Jerry uh, ditched him through North Road and I rented a car and drove to Selma. Um, and I can talk a little bit about what it was like to participate in the march, but I'll keep the focus rather on what was happening uh, at the school ones. So the, uh, the march today is considered to be one of the most important and impactful events of the civil rights movement. It mobilized public opinion among many in the North who had previously cared a little about what was going on in the South. And most historians agree that if it weren't for the march, that Congress uh, wouldn't have acted so quickly in enacting the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, which it did it five months later. Um, um, one of the things I feel blessed to have learned at Ripley and Beyond is I played a very minor role in the civil rights struggles of the 60s. And this is really what the debate at Ripley was our proposed participation in the march was the importance of being an outside agitator, as, as we were called uh, by Southerners. Do we as human uh, beings have a moral responsibility to take action against injustice, even when doing so uh, may be perceived by some as, some as not our business? I think so. Jim Clark, who was uh, the sheriff of Dallas County in Alabama, told us when we arrived that we were outside agitators, uh, agitators who were there to cause trouble. You don't live here, he said. You are outside agitators, and that's the lowest form of humanity. Uh, we agreed we were outside agitators, but not the lowest form of humanity. <laughs> uh, over the years, I've had the privilege of meeting on several occasions and talking with John Lewis, one of the icons of the civil rights movement. Uh, he was a self-proclaimed agitator who was beaten so often uh, over the years that his fellow activists uh, joked that they didn't recognize him without a bandage on his head. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best books I ever read, certainly about the Civil Rights Movement, is his memoir, Walking with the Wind, which I would uh, highly recommend. He talks about his long-standing commitment to nonviolence civil disobedience as a means of promoting social change. Um, but he also talked about putting some sting into, he didn't want just a parade of, of people, he wanted something. He said he's always believed in the power of creative disruption, uh, aggressive nonviolence. But it was Martin Luther King, of course, and I'm now winding up, is um, put it best in his 1963 letter from Birmingham jail. He said some members of the clergy in Alabama had argued against outsiders like him coming to Birmingham and stirring up trouble. I am here in Birmingham, uh, King uh, wrote in a letter to the clergy, because injustice is here. Um, I am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. And then in one of his most widely quoted passages he wrote, I cannot sit, sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. <clears throat> Thank you very much for coming and listening. And I uh, look forward to having a conversation. All right. Selma, and we want to go, and can you call a meeting? You know, I said, sure, but I thought, well, uh, okay. Um, this is all news to me, but uh, so when I called the meeting, and Jerry especially spoke very eloquently 
about what was happening and the need to address it. Um, I, like I think everyone else in the room, um, was sort of having our consciousness raised when we were being educated. And although there was certainly a discussion of the issues and a certain amount of debate, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Senate was very clearly behind supporting these people coming down to Selma. And that frankly surprised me. I mean, I did not expect that outcome. But in any case, we voted them the $400. And I thought, well, this is the story. I'm going home. And I went home. <laughs> and uh, then I began to hear rumors of um, a little uproar on campus. and. Uh, um, people kept sort of knocking on my door and saying, you know, they're getting up a petition, there are 200 signatures, and uh, they want you to call me and call the members back and vote this down, you know, retract it. So um, I thought about it for a little bit, and I guess maybe prefiguring my career as a civil servant, uh, I thought, well, in the first place, there's no provision in the student government Constitution for anything like this. You know, once we take a vote, if it's a legal vote, it's a done deal. So I thought, you know, why should this be a different case? Uh, but I thought also, more importantly, um, the people who were in the room hearing the arguments, I think were in the best position to make the decision. I mean, that's what you have. A student council or a student senate. And uh, if we had had the time, if these people were not scheduled to leave the following morning, then um, you know maybe there would have been time to have a campus discussion and uh, present people with the same kind of reasons that persuaded the Senate, but there wasn't. Uh, so it seemed to me that uh, if, you know, if I called people back together, of course they were going to retract their votes. Uh, because um, everyone was pretty cowed and upset, but I just thought that would be a bad idea. I thought it would basically be giving into mob rule, and that's not really uh, why you have a student government. So I just did nothing. First, the next morning, I had to call from the president, and he seemed to want to have a little conversation about it. So uh, I turned up in his office, I think it was around 10, and as Gary said, Jerry Thompson was there, a couple of other members of the student government were there, a couple of the deans were there. And what Fred Pinkham, who was president then, really, really wanted was for me to rescind the action that we had done to, to refuse to write the check. Uh, and I sat there and I sort of thought to myself, well, um, if you, Fred Pinkham, want to stop it, you're president of a college, you can stop it. But I'm not going to do it for you. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing, sort of in retrospect, I also, you know, now sort of recognize that, that, that Fred was really just doing his job. Um, I think he was already beginning to get some heat from the trustees. Uh, and on the one hand, uh, he really, really did not want to have a crisis on campus. But on the other hand, he really, really did not want to undermine student government. He didn't really want to undermine our ability to you know, govern our affairs to the extent that we had that authority. So I think he was torn. And I think his approach was to try to see if, uh, you know, if I could defend the action, if he, could, if he could talk me out of it. And at the end of the day, uh, since he couldn't, um, he supported us. And the check was written. Um, and you know, we uh, walked out of his office. So actually, in retrospect, I give him a lot of credit for, I think, uh, striking, at least at that point, a really good balance uh, between the fairly acrimoniously opposing interests uh, that he had to deal with. Of course, uh, when we walked out uh, of the administration building, there was a crowd of about 200 students, as Gary described, with placards and you know, they were shouting. Um, 
I, uh, I, thought, to my, I thought to myself, um, you know, I hope these people at least have a sense of irony about what they're doing. <laughs> but I don't know whether they did or not, so we walked through the crowd, we walked down to the student union. And then um, the people going to sell them got in the cars, and uh, off they went. So, um, interestingly enough, um, after that, although there were some articles in the student newspaper, there was really very little discussion on campus. And I think partly to the great relief uh, of um, Fred Pinkham, certainly, and other people involved, it just kind of it just kind of went away. It just kind of fizzled out. I think even after Jerry and uh, the other summer marchers came back, although there were some meetings and there was some discussion about what happened, I don't think they were very well attended, uh, and people just went on to their normal lives. So I guess, um, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, well, you know, what, what was going on? You know, why all the heat? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, what was the student's motivation? I don't think the issue was really the $400 uh, that could have been spent on something else. Because at the end of the day, uh, we had plenty of money to do what we wanted. There was still a spring dance. There were plenty of concerts and all that stuff. Um, and I'm not even sure the students were really expressing their indifference uh, because um, there was a little bit too much passion for that. So I think um, the students, I think, really, really, really uh, felt <clears throat> that they didn't want to be involved in things outside of Ripon. It was a very sort of inward-looking community. In some ways, there were some nice things about that, but I think in this case, uh, it led them to miss an opportunity to commute to be on the right side of history. And I think a lot of people were persuaded by this idea that it really wasn't our business. You know, it's one thing to, um, to be fair to people who are in your community, you know, to deal justly with them. But it was something else entirely, uh, you know, to go more than a thousand miles away to try to deal with something that, that I think a lot of people felt we just didn't have anything to do with. So I think, I think that's what, to the extent that people got worked up, they were worked up about. Um, unfortunately, we never really had a chance to talk about it because, uh, because all this fizzled out, because really, I think both the administration and I think even the faculty were kind of anxious that just, just kind of just go away. I think we missed a really <coughs> teachable moment for the college at that point. I think we could have had some really interesting discussions. So if I were, you know, if I had a time machine and, and I were to go back, then, you know, and I had the ability to, um, you know, to call a meeting and throw out a bunch of questions, I think um, there are a bunch of questions I think we should have and could have asked and talked about. Even if, even if the answers uh, that people gave and that we decided on weren't particularly the ones that I would want to hear. And, you know, I think obviously the first question is, what obligations do we have as citizens and as moral agents to address injustices in our own country? I, you know, I just don't think people were really interested in thinking about that. Um, I think another question is, what obligations do we have? Do we have any special obligations as students at a liberal arts college? You know, is there something about um, being here and being at this point in our lives and talking about the great ideas uh, that perhaps ought to make us specially mindful of what's going on sort of morally in our society? Um, and then another question is, what about this argument uh, that it was none of our business, that 
we were just acting as outside agitators. Was that valid? You know, what, um, uh, and I think a related question is, um, you know, is it morally relevant uh, that we may not like the methods or even the people uh, who are trying to address these issues? I mean, I think for a lot of people, uh, the leaders of the civil rights movement seem kind of scary. Um, you know, they were certainly, I think, alien to um, what we were used to. You know, to, you know they, they seem like troublemakers, and maybe they were. Uh, but does that really bear on the question of do we have an obligation to somehow heed their call? Um, I think another question we could have asked is, um, given that there wasn't any conversation on campuses, what should we expect of our teachers? What should we expect of our administration? Uh, should, it, should they have tried harder to relate um, the subject matter, you know, the ideas in literature and philosophy and history to what was happening in the real world outside? I mean, that, that just didn't happen. Is that, is that the role? of teachers in the liberal arts college. Um, and then I think another question is, how do you weigh moral and civic obligations against reasonable self-interest? I mean, what Gary did, and my other friends, is put themselves in considerable physical danger. Uh, and not everyone was prepared to do that. I certainly was not. Uh, and so, you know, how do you weigh that? And, are, and if you can't, if you're not prepared to pay those prices, are there other things that you can do? So these are some of the questions I would like to, to, to have seen asked. And I guess if I move the time machine back to here, I guess the only other question I would ask you to consider is, do any of these questions have relevance to us here and now in the world as we find it today? And I'll let you answer those questions. Thank you so much. All right, next up, we're going to have Sarah Fodhart. Prejudice um, and discrimination did not end. And um, 
there was much that still, uh, there were many um, things that were not achieved that were part of the civil rights movement that we sometimes tend to forget had been there um, that organizers and activists were pushing for all along and that people ever since have continued that legacy of um, those goals. Um, white supremacy, of course, did not die in the 1960s, and in particular, civil rights activist goals of achieving workplace equality, so these economic aspirations of the movement, uh, were in many ways frustrated. Um, the movement was, as others have said, fighting for more than a black person's right to sit down at a lunch counter next to a white person and buy a hamburger. It was fighting also for blacks' ability to pay for that hamburger, too, and this proved much harder to do, to win um, this. As the historian Nancy McLean has written of Americans, quote, widespread uh, collective amnesia, she said that the struggles for equality in the workplace during the civil rights movement have been essentially forgotten as part of um, what activists were working for. Um, McLean wrote, nearly all American social studies and history students today learn of the student-led lunch counter students. How many of you learned about that at some point? Um, yet few know anything of the quest for good jobs that was such an important part of that movement. Um, and I think that that piece, the sort of economic piece of the civil rights struggles, is really essential to bridging to today um, and the decades since Selma um, in looking at the massive racial disparities that we see um, in the 21st century in terms of blacks and whites' household wealth and homeownership, um, income, incarceration rates, and other measures of quality of life. Um, and really, Wisconsin is off the charts in this, as many of you know. In the last decade, um, Wisconsin has stood out as at the very top or within the uh, top three or so for highest rates of incarceration, child poverty, and unemployment for African Americans. Um, Milwaukee is at the top of the most racially segregated cities in the country and the highest gap in household income for whites and blacks, right? Um, and so there are all these ways that we can lose sight of the breadth and the vision of the civil rights movement and the uh, way that activists wanted to remake society. We can, uh, it's really important to see those legal victories and those triumphs, uh, but not to lose sight of the, uh, as I think Brian called it, the sort of unfinished agenda here. Uh, that's been at play. Um, but as I've emphasized in my classes over the um, decade or so that I've been teaching, there is one realm in which you see a tremendous victory um, that I haven't mentioned so far, and that's in terms of um, the way that whites talk about race following the civil rights movement. And I'm borrowing this from um, David Rodiger and other historians. To, to suggest that the civil rights movement was incredibly triumphant, not just in these legal victories, but in terms of making it so that whites no longer felt comfortable openly being associated with the idea of white superiority, um, that they thought that whites were better than blacks, or comfortable being seen as against civil rights and racial equality, that that um, uh, worry about being associated with um, white supremacy was a major uh, victory of the movement. Um, that there's an idea that progress is associated with racial equality, and that's a victory of, um, of civil rights organizers. And, and you can see this, I think, very much in all sorts of activism, all sorts of political issues in which people on both sides of an uh, issue, although there maybe can be many sides, will wrap themselves in the mantle of the civil rights movement and claim to be um, continuing the agenda of um, civil rights, but perhaps from opposite perspectives. So in the, the state that I grew up um, in Michigan a decade ago, um, there was a civil rights initiative on the ballot, right? It's called the Civil Rights Initiative. And the whole initiative was to undo affirmative action in the state, right? So expressly to challenge aspects of the civil rights movement and its legacy, but doing so by claiming to be for civil rights. So you can see that tremendous um, sort of moral victory, right? in terms of um, everyone wants to look like they're for civil rights. So um, so this is something, that, like I said, I, I said things like this to a class in fall 2014, and I have to say it's really painful, but I think I might have been wrong. So three years later, I'm not sure that's true, that in fact there has been this total victory, and that um, 
we have a permanent success of the civil rights movement in which whites are not comfortable openly expressing bigoted views in our country. I, I thought that a few years ago and I really, I don't know, I'd love to hear what other people think, but I'm not sure that that was a lasting permanent um, victory. And so I would just, you know, and by underscoring the importance of not taking for granted the achievements of the civil rights movement, um, don't take them for granted as permanent or enduring, um, but uh, appreciate those accomplishments um, like the activities that came out of the work that you all did um, leading to the March in Selma and, and looking at the ways that um, over time our, uh, our understanding of what the movement was and what it achieved it changes. All of that is dependent in part on how we view uh, the era in which we're currently living. here so far at Ripon and what I've seen. So as the beautiful introduction pretty much said that, you know, I pretty much consider myself a person that really pushes for social justice everywhere that I am. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about my story coming here and about the things that I've seen. And afterwards, as I'm done speaking, we will open up the floor to you guys to ask questions. And yeah, we'll go from there. So the reason that I came to Ripon in the first place was because out of all the colleges and universities that I interviewed with in my interview process, this college was by far the most transparent one about where they were with their racial initiatives and their inclusive initiatives. Um, I say this and I stand by it. Most colleges, most colleges and universities at this point pretty much have inclusion and diversity on their websites as buzzwords, but when you really look on their Facebook pages, their social media, you ask them questions, they really don't have answers for these questions. You look at their websites, they're not really doing much about it. You go to their website, yeah, they have the one black student and the one other student, like in their pictures, but you go there and it's really not, it's never, like the picture isn't really representative of what they're trying to get across, if you understand know what I'm trying to say. And so, in my interview process, you know, I asked the college, like, you know, the people who were interviewing me, the people I now work with, um, I asked them, so what is the college doing? to try to increase the uh, population of, um, you know, of, quite frankly, you know, to increase the population of diverse students on their campus. And they listed off a couple of things. I went to their websites and their Facebook afterward, checked out. But the thing that they said to me is like, albeit we're not seeing the results that we want to see. And so, you know, they were, they were just quite frankly, they was like, we need help. That's basically what I got from it. And that's quite frankly why I came here. Because I could have went to an HBCU when everybody, where everybody gets it, you know. But I wanted to come to somewhere where I felt like it would be a challenge. And I'm not gonna last in the challenge. Um, <laughs> um, I have some reservations about coming here. You know, um, obvious reason, like, you know, I'm from Chicago, from the south side of Chicago. You go there, you'll see a lot of people that look like me. And so, the fact of the matter is that with me coming here, with me carrying the type of attitude that I have about um, civil rights and social justice and stuff like that, I didn't feel like that I would be well received here, not only at the college, but at the town. And so, um, sure enough, and that was another reason why I came here too, is they're pretty honest about it, but they said it in a coded language, it's like, our town is pretty homogenous. <laughs> it just means it's really white. That's what it's like. <laughs> so, um, and they ain't lie. So, so yeah, um, throughout my times here, um, I'll just give you guys a couple of examples of the type of things that happened to me on my very first day here. Um, I was out driving, you know, trying to find a place to, you know, buy some groceries from. And as I'm driving, I see a red pickup truck behind me. And where I'm from, I don't like red pickup trucks. <laughs> you know, y'all can y'all can guess why. And so, um, and I'm looking in the back, you know, I'm looking at my rear view, and I'm thinking, there's nobody following me. Calm down. And I get up to the stoplight. And the guy that you say is behind me. I turn, he still follows me. I go through, I go through like a little alleyway right there on, um, on Fond du Lac Street. He follows me through there. I get back to the same stoplight again, and he pulls up on the side of me and he just stares at me. So yeah, that was my first day here. Um, you know, I immediately felt, you know, I immediately felt, you know, that they didn't want me here. 
And then, um, and then one day I was at Subway, I was my coworkers, and there was this family in there, and as soon as we walked in, they were just they were smiling and laughing with each other before we walked in. We go through the door and they all stop and stare at me with their mouths wide open. You no, know, because you know I get it. I'm a unicorn in this town. I get it. And so, um, but the next thing that happened ended up getting me was that like you know after I went up to the counter to start placing my order, I turned around. They were leaving and they sat in their car and they stared at me. Mm. So that's the type of stuff that I've experienced so far while I've been here. Um, I've also had the police called on me because they thought I was carrying a gun. Uh, for those of you, you guys know um, the suit, so I'm a hall director. And the hall directors have to carry around these big, lunky, walkie talkies for some reason because we don't have cell phones yet. <laughs> and so I had that on my hip. And I was going to like, I'm walking in the Webster's and I walk out. And there was an officer out there. He's like, hey, like, you know. Now, of course, he knew it was me. I'm the only black person in there. So you know, he's like, hey, like, you know, we got to call that you're carrying a gun. I'm like, this thing. Like, it was a walkie talkie. So. Um, but these are little things that I've been dealing with while I've been here. And so, um, and so yeah, I've also been told that there are certain parts of Ripon that I can't go to. And when I asked why, it was like, take a guess. And I was like, okay, you're you right. But, um, but uh, narrow, and so in this town, there's still some work to be done, obviously. Uh, but now I'm going to zero down to the college itself. Um, and so some incidents that have occurred here. Um, regardless of what your political affiliations are, um, when Trump started running for president, a lot of bad stuff started happening. That is something you cannot deny. Um, there was a resurgence in hate crimes, there was a resurgence in hate language, and it is what it is. And so me saying that, um, during this time to where he announced his presidency, you know, in the beginning, nobody took him seriously. But then, like, you know, he got voted, you know, he started getting a larger fan base, nobody still took him seriously. But then, but then when he won the Republican vote, everybody was like, wait a minute, you know? And it was at that point to where some things that were, that sat wrong with me started occurring. Um, as you know, I have, a big, I have a big place in my heart for black males on this campus because I, myself, am a black male. And I like to be able to make sure that they have a positive mentor because I'm the only black male professional on this campus. And so with that being said, when I would, whenever I would talk to some of these black males, we've actually had one black male student leave because he was called the N-word by some of his teammates on his team. And he felt like the coach wouldn't do anything about it. And I'm trying to keep it as real as possible. I'm not trying to pull, um, pull punches. This coach has a history of not approaching these instances of racial bigotries with, like, you know, with enough seriousness. And so he felt like that the coach wouldn't do anything for him. And so... He told me that was part of the reason why he left. Granted, it wasn't the only reason, but he said it was a pretty big part of the reason why he left, because he didn't feel welcome on his own team. Because he got injured, his teammates thought he was playing around, like, you know, that he just didn't want to play. And so, simply because he couldn't play football, they called him the end word. And so, um, and then that was also, um, and then across the country, like I said, there was an increase in hate crimes. Not only, not only like nationally, but on the collegiate level as well. And then also high tensions. When Trump won the presidency, you can hear a pin drop on his campus for months. Nobody wanted to talk. The level, the level of just, you know, so many people were uncomfortable with what was occurring on this campus and nobody wanted to talk about it. The most that you would hear is Trump won, Hillary lost. Ha, 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 ha. That's the most that you would hear. And the most sad part about this is that when these conversations wanted to, um, when these conversations needed to be had about what do we do moving forward, how do we encourage, you know, um, um, collegiate discourse, how do we encourage, you know, polite and cordial discourse about the outcome of the election, none of the students came to the event that we had. None of them came. And that, quite frankly, was kind of sad to me, like, because, one, this is a liberal arts college. You know, you would hope people will go to these type of events and be able to learn how to have these conversations, but nobody wants to have these conversations. And these conversations, regardless of what side you're on, on the spectrum, these are pretty essential to the civil rights movement. Because if we don't come to an understanding, what progress can we really make? And then, um, and then like I said, I already mentioned the N-word usage, and then I also had a student myself who was you know, who I was pretty near and dear to. This is another student. Um, somebody took somebody took a piece of paper, wrote, and I'm, I'm gonna try to watch. 
Should I say this? No. Um, I'm going to censor myself. I'm still going to tell you guys what happened, but I'm going to censor myself. But somebody wrote on a piece of paper, slid under his door, you effing N word. Somebody slid that under his door. And he ended up leaving because of that. And then I do know that from um, some of the um, Hispanic students that I um, speak to on this campus, that they've been, that they've been like, get, that they get like random no trade on the door that says like, go back where you came from, speak English. I actually had a student myself who, while he was out in town, was um, speaking Spanish with his father on the phone, and like a person, a, a fellow ripping, like got up and started yelling at him, telling him to speak English. And the fact of the matter is, the reason that I'm talking about this stuff is because we cannot act ignorant as if this stuff, as if this stuff does not happen here. This stuff happens here, and we're not going to get past it if we don't talk about it. And so, and then another thing that kind of got on my skin a little bit was, um, and I say this, I say this with as much respect as possible. Um, when there was the whole issue, when there was the whole situation about the whole. You know, when Trump was saying that he was going to, you know, that there was this ban that he was going to put in place on certain demographics and stuff like that. You know, the president reached out. Thank you, President Sarah, you appreciate it. The president reached out and, you know, he pretty much said, you guys are safe here. It's pretty much what he said. Um, but then I'm also going to offer this as a professional critique. That was another moment into where the Unite the Right um, movement happened. And I don't personally recall an email being sent out about that. And I'm saying that as respectfully as possible. That was not an email sent out about that. And then DACA as well, that was addressed too. And so I'm pretty happy about that. But I feel as if, I feel that we have to be pretty, you know, um, we have to make sure that like whenever stuff like this happens, because there were people getting bloodied at these events. There were people getting beat. A young man almost lost his life because he went out there to counter protest. And then now he's actually now he's actually um, in cuffs right now. If you guys didn't know that, he's actually in jail, like being taken to court because he defended himself, like you know. Um, and then with that event as well, because um, we would not have known who these um, who these quite frankly thugs were that beat this man if it wasn't for the work of Sean King. Sean King is a um, he's a he's a writer. He's a journalist. Um, Based, he used to be based in Atlanta, now I think he's in New York. Um, but he legitimately took all the photos that he saw, zoomed in on these faces, cleared it up, and asked people, like, and did some crowd surfing to try to see who can identify these people. And three out of the four people that have beat this man have been arrested. That's a shame that it takes all of that just to get these men. We have clear pictures of who these men are. And you have the public doing more law enforcement work than actual law enforcement themselves. That's a problem. And so, um, what else do I want to talk about? And then, I'm not going to say any names here, but I have heard another employee here say, you know, when we're talking about like you know addressing certain things on this campus and speaking about certain things, I've heard them say if we take that stance, then we might lose enrollment. We might lose students who don't agree with us. And that obviously rubbed me the wrong way because civil rights isn't an issue of politics. It's an issue of humanity and human decency. And if your concern is more so about the numbers of this college rather than whether or not people around the world are going to be treated fairly and equally, you got, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to translate it. Um, I get pretty passionate about this stuff. Um, but you lose my respect. You lose my respect, and quite frankly, you shouldn't be here. Because like it or not, our numbers in diversity are increasing. They are. Um, retention is another thing, but the diversity numbers are increasing. And as long as I'm here, I plan on putting my best foot forward to make sure that that stays that way. And so um, what I just really want, um, as far as like some improvements, and this will be the last thing I'll say before we go on um, to you know open up the floor for discussion, is that some sort of the improvements that I want is personally for us, I want to be able to see students that can have actual conversations and not be passive aggressive. Nothing will get solved that way. And when it comes to these um, biased incidents that we have on campus, albeit, bless you, it is pretty difficult. <laughs> 
I will say that it is pretty difficult to be able to close the door on a lot of these violence incidents um, because, you know, people don't want to say who did it. Um, but when we do find out who do these things, like who wrote the N-word and slid it under, you know, one of my students' doors, who called the other students the N-word, um, I would love to see quick and stern action for these things. You know, because I don't, I want, and the reason that we need to have quick and certain action is because that can serve as a proactive, as a proactive rather than reactive response to further incidents occurring. And then um, I would also like more sponsored event, um, involvement and protests and other civil rights demonstrations that happen that we can actually get to. I would love to see that. And then also, this was another thing that I thought about while I was sitting here, is do not invite known bigots to this campus to speak. <laughs> and I say that to say because, once again, regardless of your political affiliations, Michael Flynn was invited to speak to this campus. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a quote from him so that I'm not paraphrasing anything. Mm -hmm. um, there's a quote where he says, this is Islam's, Islam. He basically says Islam is a vicious cancer inside the body of 1.7 billion people on this planet and it has to be excised. Mm. And then he, in that same speech, went on to lie and say that Florida Democrats voted to impose Islamic Sharia law at the state and local level. This man is a known Islam, he's, that's bigoted language. He's sitting here saying that um, Islam in and of itself is a cancer. Regardless of where you stand, like you can practice whatever religion you want, I don't care. Like yes, there are the terrorists out there, but there's terrorism in every in every religion. There was a ter there was a terrorist at the Las at Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago. There's been there's like there was a terrorist that walked into a um walked into a um into a church and shot up black people just for the fact that they were black. Like there are people who identify as Christian on this like in this country that commit more mass murders than Muslims have done in this country. So if we're going to say that, then the fact that this man is sitting on like has been documented saying bigoted language and speaking against like an otherwise like you know um, an otherwise like awesome group of people, why was he here? If we are truly about a diversity and inclusion, there's no reason why that man should have been invited to speak here when he's on document when he's documented for saying something like that. And now, I don't believe he actually came. I believe that he ended up not coming. I believe, if I'm not mistaken. He did come? Yeah. He did? Yeah. Okay, then that's another problem for me. <laughs> he was still here. And so, and I say all this to say, once again, I love this college. I feel like that this college has received me well. It has not been as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but it's still pretty bad. <laughs> And so, um, and like I said, I say all of this in love. I say all this because I want all of us in this room to do better. If we're in this town, I want all of us to do better as students, and as administrators, as faculty members, as staff members. Because it is a collective effort if we're really going to make this college a place for everyone. Because people are not going to feel welcome to come here if they, we have Muslim students here. How do you, how do you guys think that made them feel that a known bigot, a known Islam foe came to this campus to speak? How do y'all think that made them feel? Y'all know how I'm gonna react if y'all invite Richard Spencer here? By the way, Richard Spencer is the um, spokesperson for United Right. He does he doesn't like anybody that's not white. So, um, but yeah, so I'm gonna stop rambling because I'm not gonna stop talking. So I'm gonna stop now. Um, so yeah, and it's at that point that I'm going to end my part of my speech. So thank you. Think you got it right now. Yes, uh, from my experience in Ripon and, and throughout the country, 
there's a lot of problems with uh, racism. It, Thank you. Or what is your name? Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. I really appreciate that comment. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes. I um, appreciate also that you're speaking very honestly and openly about the discrimination you have felt. I sat with a man about 20 years ago who told me about, he was a doctor, what his experience was in Milwaukee, and I've never forgotten how he told us about how difficult his life was. He said that the hardest, that if we wanted to imagine what it was like to walk in his shoes, to think of the most difficult day we've ever had, and multiply it times 10, and then remember we have to do it every day. So I appreciate that, but I do have a problem with your saying that there should be no bigoted speakers invited. We do have the freedom of speech in this country. You can take an action and not show up, which is exactly what they were trying to do when he was at, when Richard Spencer was just in Florida recently, and they had about 20 people that were his followers. The rest of the people were protesting, but they, you know, would be far better. The school said, "Don't go." You have that right, but we have to remember we have freedom of speech because if you decide that somebody who's bigoted shouldn't be there, then somebody else can decide that somebody else shouldn't be there. That's not freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. That he has the right to speak and you have the right to stay away. That would be the way to show that you didn't want him here. And I have a response to that. I have a question for you. Sure. What's the difference between hate speech and free speech? Hate speech is, of course, inflammatory. It's like probably, I would equate that, you know, with the freedom of speech, there are limits. You are not allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater. So hate speech would probably be in that, should be in that category. But that still doesn't mean that, that you know, I mean, they don't, they do say things that are wrong, but, I, but you have the right not to go there. If you're in a crowded theater, you don't have a choice when that person yells fire. But if they invite somebody to the campus, who you don't like, don't go. That's the way to show that you don't approve of them, and whoever has invited them will know better than to do it next time. But once we start eliminating people, then it becomes between you and me, who's right and who's not. I mean, it, you know, that's, that's a danger. It's like Trump saying that he's going to tr check the, the licenses of NBC and, and the, the networks because he doesn't like what they say. We have freedom of speech in this country, and I know it's a very fine line, but that would be where your education comes. Don't go to hear those people. But don't say, don't do it, because that raises another barrier, which is a problem with one of our constitutional rights, which is the most important one. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Thank I you. do. And I take it to heart, I really do. Um, but the only thing that I would say to that is that if we are a college that says that we that we're priding ourselves on our development of our inclusive um, on our inclusive programs, you know, on our programs that sponsor diversity and things like that, then what kind of message is that sent to the students here who are Muslim? When we invite, when we invite, we extended an invitation. We didn't have to. Mm -hmm. When we extended an invitation to a man that has called a population of 1.7 billion people with cancer. Like, at what point is that okay? Like, that's, that's honestly where I'm coming from. I do get what you're saying. And so, yes, I probably did speak, I probably did speak too forwardly by saying that we shouldn't invite people here that, um, that speak bigotedly. Um, but it does say something about, like, you know, there, there, there has to be a line. There is a line between hate speech and free speech. I personally believe that that was hate speech. You do not call, you do not call a, a whole group of people a cancer. That is something you don't do. If we replace Islam with, oh, black people, that black people are a cancer, or if we say Christian people are a cancer, I guarantee you, I guarantee you we wouldn't invite that man here if he were to call Christian people a cancer. I don't disagree with you. I just, I just think that the respect for the freedom of speech, that's very important in our Constitution, really has to come over all. You know, you really have to keep that in mind and how you're going to handle it. All right. And I'm sorry, that's what we're going to disagree. Hmm. Um, maybe a way to cross these two is um, there may be instances where you have to, as an institution, be creative in how you do free speech. So if you invite a controversial speaker, you don't give the speaker a sole thing. You have a panel of people to respond, or you have a person who has a differing view so that a 
person doesn't necessarily get a singular platform. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think we can think about creative ways mm -hmm. to create dialogue because, I mean, I'm actually teaching this in my ethics class this week about <laughs> the value of dialogue. If you don't encounter people who are bigoted in ways that humanizes them, that, that says, hey, you learned that bigotry. You were not born a bigot. It takes time and work to help them unlearn that. Mm -hmm. And you got to encounter people and make them feel that they're being heard before then you get them to hear you. And so I think the real challenge becomes creatively engaging people who have bigoted attitudes or attitude that we don't agree with that we want to encounter. And so maybe that's by, I mean, one of the things I really objected, even when the speaker you came, there wasn't real free form questioning. I mean, I, I think if you got a speaker, you expose them to these folks, the students, and let them ask, and let those Islamic students come and ask him all those hard questions. And, you know, maybe even do forms of protest at the event or you know, before the event. I mean, there are creative ways to engage. You know, and I'm not saying we go out and you know, invite every bigot to campus. Yeah. <laughs> but if, stu if a student group wants to bring somebody to campus, then I think we have to think about how do we creatively engage that in a way that maybe respects the student desire, but yet also doesn't let the bigotry or the, the attitude go unchallenged and un, in, you know, anyway. Well, oh, that was a great answer. I really appreciate that. Can we clap it up for that? I really appreciate that. I want to personally apologize if I came across too strongly. Because that was honestly my whole thing was that he went unchallenged. That was my entire thing. So I apologize if I came across too strong. Right. Any other questions? Dialogue. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, anything? Yes. Yeah, well, I, I have uh, maybe even a different perspective on the free speech issue. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say I'm, I'm retired from the faculty now, so I don't vote on policy or anything like that. So this is just one person's opinion. But you're from Chicago, right? Have you heard of a place in Chicago known as Bug House Square? Yes. Up on the north side? It's a park where anybody can go and set up a... Washington Square Park. What's it called? Washington Square. Right. Across from the Newberry Library. Oh, right. <laughs> but it's, it's pop... No, it's not in Hyde Park. No, no, no. no, no I'm saying the Hyde Park in Chicago. You're not okay. <laughs> My point is this. Free speech is embodied there. Anybody can go there, set up their soapbox, say whatever they want. A college or a university is not Bug House Square. We are an educational institution. We should be inviting people to speak who can actually help educate our students and ourselves. So if they, somebody like Richard Spencer, or Milo Minderbinder, or whatever his name is, <laughs> uh, Ann Coulter. You know, these people have nothing of educational value to bring. And therefore, I see no value in inviting them. Now, some, some places like uh, University of Florida, you know, had a policy that any outside group could rent a facility. And that's what happened with Richard Spencer. So they didn't see any way they could deny him paying rent. And now when you have to spend $600,000 on security, <laughs> you know, to keep it from turning into a mayhem, I think that's yet another issue. But my point is simply this. College and a university is not bug house square. People, any nut job, off the street, who gains some kind of notoriety, uh, is not a candidate 
uh, to participate in college or university discussions. Thank you. civil rights movement, um, and I think others, other scholars have pointed out that you see those, not, I'm not saying anything about women, but at some other institutions, um, those who are inviting some of the speakers that we're talking about are directly taking their lead from the civil rights movement tactics of looking for confrontation, right, and trying to get that opposition in order to forward their agenda. So you see, again, this idea of um, the, the ways, the tactics that were used so effectively half a century ago are being used in all sorts of different ways to advance different agendas. All right. Yes. So kind of bringing everything together then, um, based on the experiences from 1960s as well as the experience today, what would you say would be a very uh, proactive way of promoting uh, diversity and inclusion in civil rights here in Ripon, for example, would it be another protest? Would it be more one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings of the kind? What would you say as a panel, I guess it would open up to anyone on the panel, would be a good response for bringing it to light today? That's a good question. So I'm just going to repeat that question for everybody. Um, so essentially what he's at, oh, what, say your name one more time. Jack. Jack? Jack is asking, what can we do on the Ripper College level, like intentionally, to be able to encourage more diversity and more inclusion on this college campus. Does anybody want to go for that? Well, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's any one thing, but uh, there we go. I don't think there's any one thing, but I do think that encouraging, fostering the kind of conversations that I've heard over the last half hour, I think is certainly one way to um, promote diversity and to ensure that the people who are here from various backgrounds are in fact comfortable and the people <coughs> to benefit from their perspectives. I mean, my thing personally would be, I personally believe that, you know, that the reason a lot of people are the way that they are is because they lack the experience. <laughs> you know, like, you can ask a lot of people who say, you know, because I actually used to have my two best friends, funny, um, actually didn't like black people before they met me. That's a fun fact. Um, and they waited two years to tell me that. And I'm like, you better have it. <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter is that they did not learn that, you know, that their ways were out of place until they had that experience. You know, which is just another word for learning and educating oneself. And so that's honestly the best way to be able to be an ally on this campus, to be able to, pro to promote diversity and inclusion, is to make sure that you are intentionally educating yourself. Because there's a lot of things going on out there right now, like a lot of stuff that you won't hear about unless you go out and you look for it. And you need to go out and look for it, that way you can know the scale of what you need to learn about. You understand what I'm saying? And so that's honestly where I'm from. Get out there, have those experiences, attend a, attend a King Sierra, Go to a black cookout, you know, um, like you know, go to a go to a mosque, learn about this stuff. And that in and of itself will be able to promote diversity and inclusion at this college campus. Okay, so we're gonna take about thirty more seconds. Is there any last remaining comment, question, or anything? Yes. Yeah, uh, the, I would like to thank uh, on behalf of the Ripley community over time, the two gentlemen that were involved in the 1960 Selma incident, and they, I think, by not only what they did then, but their honesty in talking about it today, have shown us ways in which uh, it's very, very difficult to get change, particularly in a homogenous community, and that it's much easier for people to say, I don't want to hear about the outside world, because quite frankly, hearing about the outside world is scary, 
and uh, it makes us nervous because it challenges some of our fundamental assumptions and beliefs. So I want to thank you very much for having done something to challenge that. And at the same time, I'd like to thank um, the people that are working at Griffin today who are really trying to do the same thing. Uh, and under um, somewhat different circumstances because I do think that we, this stuff is in our vocabulary and in our thinking, even those of us who are white and conservative, more than it was before. And that's the result of years and years and years of people doing really good work to advancing the cause of racial equality. But as we all know, there's, there's a long way to go. But at any rate, I would like the audience to thank the people who have done um, really good work in trying to get us here at Ripon and in the whole society beyond where we are now. Can I just uh, make, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Russ. Yeah, I could just make one other uh, comment I think is uh, important. Uh, to make in this discussion, I know it's getting a lot of, uh, getting late, but I, I told this story in, in Sarah's class earlier today. But I've gotten to know over the years a an un, unsung hero of the Black Power movement uh, of the '60s. Um, Willie Ricks is his name. He was an associate of uh, Stokely Carmichael, and I I haven't argued with him about this, but we had a discussion. He was active in Atlanta at the historically black uh, college for women's Spelman college, uh, organizing uh, young women there in sit-ins and so forth. And he didn't complete high school. He never went to college. He was a young, he was basically a petty criminal thug who got involved in the civil rights movement and uh, was a very good speaker, motivator of mainly young people. <coughs> Um, and he, he told me one time that he had said to these students at Spelman College, uh, kind of an elite uh, uh, black women's college, they were training uh, young women to be you know, proper ladies and so forth, but he was organizing new cities and so forth. And uh, he, he told them, he said, uh, um, you, you are here studying history. I'm out there making history. And we've had a little bit of a discussion about that. And I tried to explain that it's possible to do both. I mean, you can be an activist uh, while you're also getting an education and doing uh, good things on behalf, on behalf of uh, fighting injustice. <coughs> so I think he was saying it a, a little bit of a joke, but there was some seriousness to it that we're just wasting our time at schools. You should be out in the streets. Uh, organizing people. Uh, but I think you can do both, and I think what we tried to do when we were students at Griffin was uh, to prove that in our spare time and trying also to make it through college, which I barely did. <laughs> um, um, so anyway, I think that's uh, a good lesson to learn as well. That it's not either or. You can be active as a student. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank for all of you for being very frank and honest. I hope this conversation that we start today will continue. Um, as LaParis said and Kiona said, when we tried to bring people together recently, very few came. After this conversation, we can't let this stop. We have to, as a community, continue respectfully, even if we disagree. And I certainly, I think I speak for my colleague, Henrik Schatzinger, that the Center for Politics and the People and the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, this will not be our last event to discuss these issues. So we thank you for your frankness. There's one more alone here from 1969, Steve um, Thompson, the son of Jerry Thompson. Steve. You were involved in civil rights. You were an activist against the Vietnam. What do you think your father would think if he was sitting here today? Well, he'd be uh, 
be very glad to see this is happening. One thing I was going to mention, you know, he was not anxious to go down to Selma. And my mother was very adamant that, hey, you know what you're getting yourself into. And he told my mother, he said, you know what? Black people in Selma get up every day worried whether they're going to live that day. He says, I don't have that problem, but now I do, and I'm going to join it. So Very well said. Yeah. Thank you for coming back, Steve. Thank you. Tomorrow at 11.15, um, we have another speaker that the center is sponsoring, mm -hmm. Karen Henriksen, who is sitting here. She is a Swedish journalist. She has just finished a biography of Donald Trump in Swedish, and she will be speaking on how Europeans today view President Trump. That's 11.15 tomorrow in Great Hall. You're all invited. There's a reception in Wednesday Lounge if you want to continue the conversation. Thank you all for coming for such a great discussion. Yeah, we did. Yeah. We just missed three. We just missed three. Yeah, the, the reason why we have any problem with this is it has to, uh, it has to, when you put it on there, it has to drop in, and it all is dependent upon the Wi Fi. So when she talked to Ben, she's like, no, you gotta. It said that it was connected to the Wi Fi, but then he said you have to turn it on and off. Connect to the Wi-Fi. It has nothing to do with the Wi-Fi. So it just has to connect to the Wi-Fi, and it did, and it's recorded the whole thing an hour and thirty minutes. So yeah, I'll turn it off now.